right, so this should be the last review that you get to watch this semester unless you're lucky enough to have to take the final exam. So after I, after you take the chapter seven test, you should hang around for me to grade it. This test should grade pretty quickly. And when I give you your test back, I, I'll either write or physically tell you what your grade's gonna be if you decide not to take the final and what you'd have to get on the final to change your grade. Because the final is completely optional, so it's completely up to you whether you take that or not. Um, I haven't written the test yet for chapter seven or any test for chapter seven ever as I'm um, going into lecturing on this. And as I look at my review, generally I make my tests a little bit shorter than my review, but this review only has 13 questions on it. I would guess if I was gambling that the test is probably gonna have more than 13 questions. They're gonna be the same kinds of questions, but you'll just get some duplicate questions. I'd probably guess, you know, 20 questions. So like the first three problems on this are graphs. I don't know, probably on the test, maybe I'll make five graphs, so two more graphs. And then four through 10 are solving for X, and maybe I'll add a, maybe another three more solving for Xs. And then, then there's word problems at the end. There's three word problems on this. I would, I can't imagine putting more than three word problems. So if I'm gonna beef this up to go from 13 problems to more than 13 problems, a couple more graphs would put me to 15 problems. Maybe three more of the solving for X would put me up to 18 problems. And then we can do 18 problems. Well, that really was 18. 18, I'm trying to figure out how many points worth each they would be. And 18 problems at kind of five or six points each. Maybe I'd make the word problems worth six points and the other problems worth five points. That would be my best guess. Like I said, I haven't written the test before I'm actually doing this lecture, so. But expect it to be more than 13 questions. Expect it, I, as I'm you know, thinking in my head right now, three word problems has to feel like enough for any test. And then we'll just bump it up with some of the other problems. So we did a bunch of graphs in section 7.1. And when the exponent was just an X, we did the table that had zero in the middle of the X column. And then if it had a sign in the exponent, then we changed that sign. We'll get to that in a second. And you'll be given a blank graph on the test, but for homework purposes, you certainly don't need graph paper but I brought graph paper just because it makes it easier for me. So I'm gonna do a graph, make my table of values, sketch a graph, and then the domain and range should be easy. For all of the functions that we graph, the domain was negative to positive infinity. That's gonna be the case here. So when I do this problem three, f of x equals the three to the x, because there isn't a plus or minus after the x in the exponent, I throw a zero in the middle of the X column and then go smaller and bigger. And some of the ones on the videos, I did seven numbers in my X column. That's just so I got comfortable with graphing. And then after I got comfortable with graphing, I cut it down to five and that's enough numbers in the X column that I'll be content with any graph that I get. And so even without graphing, I could answer the domain question. And then every one of our range questions was some number comma infinity. That's, I mean, I could make that not the case if I did something kind of bizarre to the um, function, but we didn't have anything like that. So this is, is almost guaranteed to be the domain and the range, and I'll be able to confirm it when I see the graph. So I'm gonna steal the, the table from my calculator. So mode, and then seven, f of x equals three alpha x. Start at negative two, end at two, step one. So I get negative two, that's, I didn't enter the function right, because negative two should be a decimal. I forget, somehow forgot the exponent. Let me re-enter this, mode table three 
exponent alpha x. Somehow I missed the exponent. It's pro I can't see what I typed anymore, but I know my table was wrong. You gotta see some decimals in these tables somewhere. So I didn't see any. So recalibrating, start at negative two, end at two, step one, better. So negative two first, and then point one. Second, this time I said to round to one decimal, which makes more sense. Negative one and positive point three. Zero and one. One and two. And two and nine. That's plenty enough points to make a reasonable graph. So negative two and point one, that point is just, just barely, barely hovering above the x-axis over negative two on the x-axis. And then negative 1.3, that's a little bit higher than the last point. And then the next points are easy to plot. 0, 1 is right on the y-axis at 1. 1, 2, and 2, 9. And then we just connect the points the best we can. Eventually you have to stop drawing and usually you throw an arrow up. It means the graph doesn't end. And then usually on one of the edges, the graph just kind of flattens out and that's the case here. The graph actually should get, you know, again, really, really close to the x-axis, but it'll never touch or cross the x-axis. And the y-coordinate of the x-axis is zero. And that's why all these graphs that look like this had a range from zero to infinity. All the domains and ranges in this chapter had all round brackets. That's everything. Most of our domains and ranges are gonna be this unless there was, you know, like a number added or subtracted after the exponential piece. So like this problem, not that it's readable, 2 to the x plus 5, that its domain would be negative to positive infinity, but its range wouldn't be 0 to infinity. This plus 5 is going to make the range 5 to infinity. And this function, 2 to the x minus 3 minus 4, what makes it range not 0 to infinity is this minus 4 that's not part of the exponent. That actually is going to make the range from minus 4 to infinity. So, and if I don't see a number after the exponential part, the range is going to be 0 to infinity. So for 2, my y values are going to wind up looking a lot the same because the base is 3, and usually the way I construct my tables, I kind of force the y values to be the same. Oh yeah, I should probably add a graph that I think is probably test worthy. So for 2, m of x equals 3 to the x minus 6. For my table, when there's a plus or minus in the exponent, I'll take the number in the exponent and change its sign, throw that in the middle of my x column, and then go down a few and up a few. The domain for all the graphs we're gonna do on our test is negative to positive infinity. The range is usually some number to infinity. I'm going to get my y's again. They're going to be the same y's, just with different x's. So mode 7 and then 3 exponent alpha x minus 6. Start at 4. Whoa. This should be 7 and 8. I, uh, it's early. I don't know. It's before 5 in the morning, but you'd think I could do that at least. All right, so four, I'm gonna do point one, five, I'm gonna do point three, six, I'm gonna do positive one, seven, I'm gonna do three, and eight, I'm gonna do nine. And again, usually the way I force my X columns, um, it makes the Y start to duplicate if the bases are the same. So four and point one is find four on the X axis and just go a little bit up. 5 and point 0.3, find 5 on the x-axis, go a little bit more up, and then the easy ones. 6, 1, 7, 3, 8, 9, 
and then kind of connect the points, you know, the best you can. Probably can do it better than I can. The graph should be just microscopically above the y-axis and go out forever to the right. And this is a reasonable graph, and the range for that is zero to infinity. Again, because the graph always stays above the x-axis and the y-coordinate of the x-axis is zero. For three, one half to the x plus three, the fraction would make it to be a little bit tedious if I was working without a calculator to get my table, but my calculator won't have any problems pushing through this. And when you have a fraction base, you get a backwards graph. It means it's gonna go up on the left and down on the right. I looked at the exponent, the sign in the exponent with the number was a positive three, so I changed its sign, threw it in the middle of my x column. That would be the table I'll use. Should be able to enter this just like this. So mode seven parentheses fraction one half parentheses exponent alpha x plus three and then Start at negative 5, end at negative 1, step 1. So next to negative 5, I need a positive 4. Next to negative 4, I need a positive 2. Next to negative 3, I need a positive 1. Next to negative 2, I could put 0.5 or I could put 1 half, whichever you prefer. And next to negative 1, I could put 0.25 or I could put 1 quarter. It kind of shows me both and I don't have any strong preference at this point. So I'm gonna plot the points the best I can. Oh, I like this freaking upside down. Sorry about that. Um, make it right side up, and then hopefully you can handle this. That was really poor planning. So negative five, positive four is about there. And then negative four, positive two is about there. Negative three, one. Negative two, one half negative one, one quarter. So it looks something like that. Again, it just, it kind of hovers above the y-axis, never touches nor crosses the y-axis. And then for every problem that's gonna come on our test, the domain is gonna be negative to positive infinity. And then if the graph hovers right above the x-axis, the range is zero to infinity. So I should do an extra graph. I'll call this, and I won't call it anything. I'll just say extra graph because, like I said, I probably need to add a few problems. So this is going to be not on the review, but could be like something on the test. I'll make it so the range is a little bit different. How about f of x equals 4 to the x minus 6 plus three. So because I need to expand the test, add this to your review, and so it shouldn't be terribly hard because your calculator does the dirty work anyways. So middle of my x column, I'm going to put the number six because the exponent has a minus six in it, and then I'm going to go smaller a couple, bigger a couple, and those are the y's, x's, I'm going to get the y's, and of course, see what I do like that. So mode, table, f of x is four exponent alpha x minus six. Forgot the plus three. Mode, table, I don't wanna go back on that, so I just started over. Four exponent alpha x minus six. Get out of the exponent and tag the plus three. Start at four, end at Eight, step one. First point is one and three point zero six. I'm almost it's four and three point zero six. I'm gonna round that to three point one. You can write three point zero six. Next one is five and three point two five. You could write three point three if you wanted to round it properly, but three and a quarter is fine by me, although it voids my instructions. And then six and four, seven and seven and eight and 19. 
good enough. So now I'm just gonna plot those points, say what the domain and range is. So four and 3.1, this graph isn't gonna go beneath positive three. That positive three here tells me that positive three is gonna kind of work like the x-axis in the last few graphs. The graph won't dip beneath that, that line. So four and 3.1, I go to four on the x-axis and then up just a little over three. And then five and three and a quarter, I go to five on the x-axis and a little higher, more over three, and then they're easy. Six and four, seven and seven, eight and 19. reasonable enough graph. I like throwing arrows at the end saying they keep going. And so the domain for every exponential graph that we're going to do is negative to positive infinity. And then the range for exponentials usually have double round brackets that end at infinity. And in this case, the starting for my range is going to be that number on the y-axis where the graph kind of just hovers above, and that's going to be 3. So I would guess you, you might get one like this. You might even get something like, you know, f of x equals 1 half to the x plus 2 minus 5, maybe. So be, and be able to do that um, just because I need to give more graphs. And that's not terribly hard. If I was doing that, I'd make a table. I'd have negative 2 in the middle. Then I'd go negative 3, negative 4, negative 1, 0. Bust out my calculator, mode 7 for table, parentheses, fraction, 1 half, exponent, alpha, x plus 2, out of the exponent, minus 5, start at negative 4, end at 0, step 1, so negative 4, negative 1 I would plot, negative 3, negative 3 I would plot, negative 2, negative 4 I would plot, negative 1, negative 4.5, and 0, negative 4.75. Since I'm here, I might as well just do this. I'm going to do it on the same graph. I'll just make it a different color. So what this graph would look like is it would bottom out at negative 5 on the y-axis, negative 4, negative 1 would be one of its points, which would be here, negative 3, negative 3, another one of its points here, negative 2, negative 4 here, negative 1, negative 4 and a half there, 0, negative 4.75 there. It's a backwards graph because of the fraction, and it bottoms out at negative 5 on the y-axis because of the minus 5. This graph its domain is negative to positive infinity, and its range is negative five to infinity. So be prepared for something like each of these two graphs, which weren't on the review, just so my test is you know, adequately long so that, the, that you know, the problems aren't worth 10 points each because that gets really costly when you make a mistake on a 10 point problem compared to a five or six point problem. All right, so now into solving the equations. So some of these, like this, I can just look at and know the answer is x equal to 2 because I know that 3 to the second power is 9. And you're more than welcome on a problem that's that basic just to write the answer down if you know it. If you don't know it, we put our calculator into mode 1 for computation. And I do a prime factor tree for 9. So I go 9 equals shift factor. And I can rewrite the right side as 3 to the second power. And once you get the problem written such that each side has the same base, you drop the basis and set the exponents equal to each other. And that's all there is for number 4. 5 is about the same thing. 2 is a prime number, which is good. 16 is not a prime number, so I'm going to do a prime factor tree. I'm going to go 16 equals and then shift and factor. So 16 is 2 to the 4th, so I can rewrite this problem as 2 to the x plus 5 equals 2 to the 4th, 
once you get both sides written with the same base, you drop the bases and set the exponents equal to each other. And for this one, I'm just going to minus 5 from both sides. Get x equal to minus 1. And if I want it to check, it's completely optional, but never a bad idea. Should go back to the original problem, which is up there. And I should plug in negative 1 for x, and then simplify to make sure that simplifies to 16. So I would just go to exponent negative 1 plus 5. When I hit enter, I have to see 16. And I do, so I know I did it OK. On 6, I have to really think of this as 125 to the x minus 4 with the 125 in a parentheses, and I have to think of the 5 as 5 to the first power. I'm going to do a prime factor tree for 125. So 125 equals shift factor, and 125 is 5 cubed. So now I can think of this as 5 cubed to the x minus 4. The reason I put a parentheses in is because that cube needed to be multiplied by both the x and the 4. And had I not put the parentheses in, it might not look like you're supposed to multiply by the 4, the 3 and the 4. So I did three steps to make the um, each side have the same base. Once you get the bases the same, you can drop the bases and set the exponents equal to each other. We didn't have any factoring in this chapter. I don't think there should be any on the test then. I'm going to get 13 over 3 for an answer. I can check it without even really writing what I'm checking. If I wanted to check this, I just need to change that x to 13 over 3. It has to reduce to 5. So let me try that. So 125 exponent, change that x to the fraction 13 over 3, and then tag the minus 4 after it. That's what I would get if I plugged in my answer into the original problem. It better say 5 when I hit enter because that's what the left side simplifies to and the right side's already 5. And it does, so I know I'm correct. For 7, the side that has the fraction, we had to take the reciprocal of the fraction, and we know that when we take the reciprocal of the fraction, we have to write the opposite of the exponent. When the base is a fraction, it doesn't help us to have a base of a fraction. And what we did is we just used the rule kind of in reverse from chapter P. And so this whole left side can be written as 2 to the negative x power. And that's the same as 2 to the negative x. Doing a prime factor tree for 64, which is 2 to the 6. So flipping the left side gives me the 2 that I needed, but it made the exponent change signs. Prime factoring the 64 gave me the other 2 that I needed. Now I set the exponents equal to each other. And the exponent negative x really means negative 1x. And to solve for x here, I need to divide both sides by negative 1. My answer should be negative 6, or x equal to negative 6. If I wanted to check, I'd have to go, is 1 half to the negative 6 power equal to 64? Easy enough to check. So parentheses, fraction, hello parentheses fraction 1 half to the negative 6 power and that gives me 64 equals 64 so I'm good same sort of strategy for 8 with the fraction I'm gonna make this 5 over 1 and when I flip a fraction I have to find the opposite of the exponent the opposite of positive 3x is negative 3x. The opposite of negative 1 is positive 1. 
And on the right side, I know 25 in my head to be 5 squared. I don't need my calculator for it. Now on the left side, I can write this as 5 to the negative 3x plus 1 because 5 over 1 is equal to 5. And then I don't need the parentheses once the fraction is gone. So that's a good rewrite for the problem. Now, I'm, since both the bases are 5, I'm going to drop the bases and set the exponents equal to each other. I'm going to minus 1 and get negative 3x equals to 1, and then divide by negative 3. And I get x is 1 over negative 3. It looks odd to see the negative in the denominator, and I could just tuck it up in the numerator or put it in front of the fraction. But you could have 1 over negative 3. You could have negative in front of the fraction, and I usually put my negative in the numerator. Let me check this just by going to that problem and throwing a negative 1 third in for x. I'm going to go parentheses, fraction 1 over 5, parentheses, exponent, 3 times fraction negative 1 third minus 1. Again, it looks enough like that problem with the x changed to minus 1 third, and I get 25 like I needed to, so I know my answer is right. For 9, because neither number is prime, I have to do a prime factoring for each. And usually when, when there's an exponent and I have to do a prime factoring, I bring in a parentheses, so I know to multiply the exponents. Now I'm a prime factor 27. I have that memorized, but you can use your calculator. And I'm going to prime factor 9. Again, I have that memorized, but you can use your calculator. On the left side, I'm going to multiply the exponent of 3 by both the x and the 4 and drop the parentheses and get 3x minus 12. On the right side, I'm going to multiply the exponent of 2 by the exponent of x and drop the parentheses and get 3 to the 2x. Now I have both sides with the same base, so I set the exponents 3x minus 12 equal to 2x. I'm going to minus 2 minus 3 3x minus 3x. On the left side, that'll leave me the negative 12. On the right side, that'll give me a negative 1x. And then divide by negative 1, divide by negative 1. And I get my answer of 12 equal to x. When I go to check this, I'm going to get probably huge numbers or scientific notation that I'll just have to jot down. So for the checking, I should is 27 to the 12 minus 4 equal 9 to the 12th power. I'm quite certain I'm going to get a bad looking number. So checking 27 exponent 12 minus 4 gives me 2.82429 and then times 10 to the 11th. I don't care that it's a bad number. I just have to have the same bad number when I do 9 to the 12th. So when I do 9 exponent 12, I get the same 2.82429 with more decimals times 10 to the 11. Again, I don't care exactly what number I get as long as the numbers are the same. Do the same thing that I just did. I'm going to go parentheses 25 to the x minus 3 power equals parentheses 125 to the 4x minus 7 power prime factor the 25 into 5 squared, prime factor the 125 into 5 cubed. Now clear the parentheses by multiplying the exponents. So I'm going to go 2 times x and 2 times minus 3 for the exponents on the left side. And on the right side I'm going to go 3 times 4x, 3 times minus 7. Now both sides have the same base, so I've dropped the bases and set the exponents equal to each other. And I'm going to minus 2x and plus 21 from both sides, just because it makes the x's positive and the numbers positive. You know, you could have minus 12x and added 6, you'll get the same answer, just your work will look a little uglier. 
So 2x is canceled, minus 6 plus 21 is positive 15. On the right side, 12 minus 2 is 10x. And then divide by 10, divide by 10. Reduce that fraction, 15 divided by 5 is 3, 10 divided by 5 is 2. For checking, I should go 25 to the 3 over 2 minus 3. That should equal 125 to the 4 times 3 over 2 minus 7. So I'll check that real quickly. Left side, 25 exponent fraction 3 over 2 minus 3 is 1 over 125. Right side, 125 exponent 4 parentheses fraction 3 over 2. I could have put a time sign instead of the parentheses. Minus 7. And I get 1 over 125 again. So, calculator does the tables. So, you, you sh should do those reasonably well. Every answer I get for the middle questions, I can check on my calculator. So, it's no real reason to put down a wrong answer. And they're, they're kind of repetitive. Um, I need to make more of these, but I can't think of, of they're not going to be different. I mean, all the tricks that, that we need, I've done already. So I'm not going to make more of these. There's just going to be more, more of the same. And then the word problems, I can't imagine putting more than three word problems. So for 11, we, we have the growth formula. It's kind of split here because I made a big font. But the growth formula that we used the P sub 0 is the starting amount, E is a button on our calculator, the R is the growth rate as a decimal, and the T is the number of years. So as I go through this problem, the top one, just the top gives me the, the equation. That's all the top paragraph was for. And then the second paragraph talks about the population in Arizona, and I think it's around this, but it might not be. So the 6.5 is the beginning amount, and that's the piece, what I put in for P sub zero. So P sub zero, the initial population that we're dealing with is six and a half million. The next number I see is the rate. It's 1%, but for the calculator purposes, I need to make that 0.01. It goes next, it goes in the exponent with the E. And the T is the number of years, which is 40. And I have to put a parenthesis or a time sign between the 0 0.01 and the 40. And that's all I have to do is enter that in my calculator and round to two decimals. And I'll say that's the population of Arizona in millions. So I'm just going to enter this. I'm going to go 6.5. To get that E, you hit Shift in LN. And then 0 0.01 times 40. So in 40 years, this says it's going to be 9.696 million people in Arizona. So 9.696. This 6 is going to round that 9 up to a 10, which is going to round that 6 up to a 7. So I'm going to say it's 9.70 million because it's million after that. I could say 9.7 million people in Arizona. You don't need the zero after the seven, but it's fine. If you put it there, you put it there. If you don't, you don't. It says to round to two decimals. It doesn't mean you have to show two decimals if the second one's a zero. 12 uses the decay formula, same essential formula, except it has a negative next to the R, and it works for shrinking populations. Same formula talks about Japan, which I think is declining in population. Um, the P sub zero is the initial population of 125 million. The shrinking rate is 2%, which I'm going to write as 0 0.02, and the time is five years. So I'm going to take those numbers and go 125 times E to the negative 0 0.02 times 5 should get a number less than 125 million. So 125, shift, and then the LN key. And then negative 0 0.02 times 5 gives me 113.104. And the 4 
tells me to leave that zero alone. So I could write 113.10 million people or just 113.1. So my answer is going to be 113.10 million people living in Japan. I don't, I, I know that they have negative growth. I don't think it's negative 2%. It's probably like negative one tenth of 1% or negative one one hundredth of 1%. But nevertheless, when you have declining population, that doesn't do good things for your, you know, your economy. Like, I don't know if there's less people living, like there's less people wanting to buy the houses that exist. You don't need to build new houses for new people. And it's not a good thing probably economically, but maybe good things environmentally, but economically it's, disaster. All right, last formula, the compound interest formula. A is the ending amount of money. P is the starting amount of money or the beginning amount of money. One's the number one. R is the interest rate. N is the number that relates to the word after compounded. It's actually how often interest is being paid each year. And then the NT, the N is the same N, the T is the number of years in this case. So for our problem, the starting amount of money is $5,000. The interest rate is 3%, but I'm going to make that 0 0.03. And then after the word compounded, I see quarterly, there's four quarters in a year, so I'm going to put four for N. And then for T, I'm going to plug in six for the six years. I'm going to shove the numbers into the formula. The amount of money I have in the future is equal to 5,000 times one plus 0 0.03 over four to the four times six power. And I'll break that out. Um, so your math career could be done right now, which has got to be a beautiful feeling. I would always suggest, especially if you're kind of you know, 18, 19, 20, that you go ahead and take either math 142 or 151, kind of depending on what you might possibly do in the future. Because if you ever want to get a four-year degree, this class won't count for any four years degrees. You need a class that says college something, either college algebra or college math. If you have no idea what your future major might be, Math 151 College Algebra is a safer course because it counts for more majors than Math 142. Um, you know, if you're 46 years old and you know you're just getting your, your two year nursing degree and you're never gonna go for a bachelor's degree and this is all the math you have, then you're probably safer to stop. Unless in the back of your mind you might think, oh, I might want to get a BSN. If you want to, you should definitely go on and take another math class. I teach you know, both the higher classes after this, before calculus. And you can take me, I'd love it. But if you don't want to take me, always ask other, tell other students to ask other students who to take. But if you can't find a consensus from other students, you can go to writemyprofessors.com and search out what teacher that you might think about taking. Um, I don't know how good the site is. My ratings are super high, which is kind of nice because my mother reads them. Um, but a lot of times the ratings are kind of extremes. The people that write really good probably aren't as good as they, they rate. And the people that aren't that rate really poorly probably aren't as bad as they, they rate. But nevertheless, it's, it's something to go by. And you might take somebody that rates really well and hate them. You might take somebody that rates really poorly and love them. So it's not a guarantee because everybody is different. But nevertheless, at least it's something if you can't ask somebody whose opinion you kind of you know think you might connect with to um, help you through that decision. And you can always come visit me if you want. And um, I can help you decide what course might be appropriate for you. And I'm not supposed to make any recommendations about teachers, but I mean, I might be able to, depending on who you are and what your goals are, um, suggest someone to take or not take. 
some of the teachers um, that are hard teachers might be ranked poorly because they're hard, but some of the hard teachers are really good to take if you have to take a lot of math. Whereas if 151 is your last math class, then taking a teacher that's hard, maybe not as important, maybe you want to take a teacher that's maybe easier for, for you, but whatever, you can visit me if you like and I'll try to help you. So finishing up this problem, I just put the numbers in and now I need to round to two decimals because it's money. It doesn't say to round to two decimals, but because it's money, I'm assuming I'm rounding to two decimals. So I get $5,982 and this six cents, I need to round up to seven cents because the number after the six tells me to round it up. So that's everything. So if you could do the 13 problems on the test, the two extra graphs that I did on the review, the two extra graphs I did bumps us up to 15 problems and expect you know, another maybe two or three problems like the middle group of problems where you're solving for X. So my you know best guess, because I haven't written the test, like I said, is kind of 18 problems. Some of them were five points each, some of them were six points each so that it will, you know, won't kill you if you miss a problem. I hate to make a test where if you miss one problem, all of a sudden you miss it completely, it takes you into a B. It's just a horrible thing to do. All right, so visit me if you're not feeling good about any of this, and also hang out for me to grade your test so you can find out you know, the realities of the final exam. And if you're confused at all about my final exam policy, just let me know and I can sit down with you or chat with you on the phone and explain it to you the best I can again.